Okay, so thank you for letting me talk on new advances in reflux, or medical advances in reflux to a, to a surgical group of people predominantly, but I, I see a few gastroenterologists in there as well. Um, so there was some pretty good progression over the years with medical therapy with antacids changing to alginates, then we had H2 blockers, and then in the 1990s, omeprazole and PPIs revolutionized um, how we treat reflux. And I still think there's very few drugs that we have that are more effective than PPIs when they work. They're absolutely amazing. Then we sort of stalled a little bit. We started to get slightly more expensive PPIs that maybe worked in a, in a slightly different way. Um, but this was maybe 20 years ago. And then in the 20 years since, I think we've had plenty of efforts at trying to advance our medical um, treatment of reflux, but we haven't been particularly successful. Um, so this talk is, is often a dreadful talk to give about what's changed in medical advances of reflux because often there's nothing to talk about. But I think in recent years, there's been a little bit. Um, so I'll hopefully bring us a little bit up to date on what's happening in terms of medical treatments for reflux. Just to address going back 25 years, the differences between all these different PPIs that we, we have and this idea about switching between PPIs from one PPI to another, there really is almost no difference between these PPIs. If this, this old study comparing pantoprazole to omeprazole, um, the outcomes in terms of uh, symptom response is, is almost identical. Similarly, if you move to esomeprazole, so esomeprazole maybe has a, a slightly longer um, duration of action, but in terms of symptom response, so on the left here, comparing esomeprazole to omeprazole and on the right, esomeprazole to lansoprazole, we're really talking about very, very mild benefits over, over what we already have. Um, but the other thing you see on these um, is that there's a fairly big gap here. So this is the gap where patients are not having sustained response to treatment. Um, so we've got a good maybe 20 to 30% of people who do not respond adequately to their proton pump inhibitors. Um, so there is a there's a need, and this is why, you know, as Nick says, I'm a I am a big believer in surgery in the right situation. But I think there's also why there's a gap and a need for us to, to make advances across the across the spectrum, both medical and surgical. So what are the shortfalls of our PPIs? Why do they fail? Well, one of the things is timing. It's a really simple thing, but PPIs work on active proton pumps. So they bind to pumps that are working, and po proton pumps work just before meals and during meals. So the common thing you'll see is a patient has breakfast and takes their PPI or maybe takes it just before bedtime. The horse has already bolted at that point. So the person who's getting nocturnal symptoms who takes the PPI just before they go to bed, they've already made their acid when they eat their meal, they take the PPI, it doesn't neutralize the acid, it doesn't bind to inactive proton pumps and so they get reflux. Nocturnal breakthroughs are a problem. So uh, these series of lines are a pH, uh, uh, pH indicators on a, on a range of different proton pump inhibitors. And we can see that almost uniformly, there's a drop in, in the pH that happens in the stomach um, by around eight to 10 o'clock. This is with once daily PPIs. It can probably be overcome with twice daily PPIs, but nocturnal breakthrough is a problem. The other thing is they're quite slow to work. Um, so they don't work in a reactive way. They're, they're problem with, one of the problems with PPIs is they take several days to get to maximal effect. And what this means is, Firstly, the response is quite slow, but secondly, it means that they can only really work if they're taken every day. So there, you end up with a situation where a patient has to take a PPI and maybe even somebody who gets symptoms every few days, they'll end up being on the medication every day because if they don't, they don't get adequate response. So it, it has to be a proactive long-term medication usually rather than a reactive medication. And we all know that patients who start PPIs often don't manage to stop them. And then there's the side effects. Um, it was already, uh, we've already seen from the, um, the, the previous talk that there have been lots of concerns about side effects with PPIs. This was the last one I've seen, September 2020, a, a study in the BMJ about possible risk of type 2 diabetes with PPI. We already know about the, uh, the studies and the things on the internet about cancer, dementia, heart disease. Most of these are probably not very very uh, robust, but even so, there's a growing concern within the population and a bit within the medical community about the use of these PPIs. I'd say on the flip side of that, there are 60 million prescriptions per year in England of P PPIs, and we've been using them for the last sort of couple of decades. So I think we do have quite a lot of data. And there's not many drugs where we have such a 
huge amount of data and still feel pretty confident about using it. The other thing with PPIs is that um, when you have reflux of material from the stomach into the esophagus, it isn't just acid. You've got bile acids, pepsin, bacteria. What the PPIs do is they neutralize the acid, but they don't stop other things coming up. So they don't reduce reflux per se, or not very little reduction in reflux, but they do change the acidity of reflux. Um, and there is certainly some data that bile acids may play a role in reflux symptoms. Pepsin may play a role, possibly even bacteria. Uh, I'm sure when we hear about LPR, there'll be some, some discussion about, uh, about weakly acidic contents or maybe pepsin causing symptoms. So PPIs don't stop all reflux, they just stop the acidity. So what can we do when patients have refractory symptoms? Well, we can suggest to change lifestyle. They've usually done that by the time they come and see us. So I suspect that everybody else's uh, experience is very similar to mine, that the impact of lifestyle changes is almost zero. You can add alginates. I'll talk a little bit about that. Prokinetics are often given, domperidone, metoclopramide. There's reasons why we don't do that now. Um, because uh, of, of potential concerns about safety of these medications. But the other thing I'll say, I'm not presenting the data here, but the data on, on their use is actually extremely limited. Prokinetics maybe are about as effective as H2 blockers, which are nowhere near as effective as PPIs. So prokinetics is something we often do, um, and maybe it makes us feel better, uh, but it rarely makes the patients feel better. Um, and anti-reflux procedures, of course, are an option. Um, and that's something that we're gonna be uh, hearing a lot about today, so I'm not going into that, but I, I do believe it's a, a very important place in the treatment of reflux. So in terms of medication, what can we do? Um, so there's a bit of a move towards medications that may be able to achieve better acid suppression. So proton pump inhibitors work on the, uh, the proton pump. Um, as I mentioned, they are dependent on active proton pumps. Uh, there are new um, medications with potassium uh, competitive acid blockers, uh, PCABs, um, which are which bind to potassium uh, and prevent the exchange of potassium and hydrogen uh, into the uh, uh, into the parietal cell uh, caniculus and prevent the acid being secreted into the stomach. Um, now, the benefit of these drugs, uh, so that they are they're not pro-drugs like PPIs, and they inhibit active and inactive pumps because they're not dependent on the proton pump being active. They bind to the potassium and prevent the exchange, which means they can be given in a meal independent dosing. So it doesn't matter when you give these medications, they still uh, are able to prevent acid secretion. And that's very important. And they're not affected by polymorphisms. There are a few patients, as we know, who have um, cytochrome polymorphisms, which can affect um, the metabolism of PPIs. These are a pretty rare group, but um, PCABs are not affected by that. And the other thing, if we look at the graph I showed before of the, or the, the image of, of how proton pump inhibitors take several days to get to effect, PCABs have maximum uh, effect after just one dose. And so uh, they have a fast onset of action, which maybe makes them um, a bit more uh, helpful in terms of a uh, reactive use. So if somebody's starting to develop symptoms, you can take a PCAB and actually get a pretty quick response um, as opposed to a PPI that doesn't have that. So um, the, the pharmacokinetics of PCABs are actually quite um, beneficial compared to PPIs. In terms of data, so these drugs have been um, studied in Japan so far. There are ongoing studies uh, in the UK at the moment uh, to try and replicate this data in the UK and the US, we're trying to replicate this data in, in Western populations. But this is a study published um, 2019. And I'll, if, so this, if we look after eight weeks of treatment, and this is healing of esophagitis, by the way, so this is not symptoms, so this is healing of esophagitis. And here we can see that there's a 99% uh, healing of esophagitis with uh, vonoprazan, which is the, the PCAP being studied here. Uh, and 95.5% with lansoprazole. There's not much of a difference there. It's a significant difference, but I'm not sure that we would consider this to be clinically very helpful. Um, certainly though, the onset is quicker. So by two weeks, 90% um, of esophagitis had healed with venoprazam versus 80, about 80% with lansoprazole. So there's, there's some evidence that it heals esophagitis quicker. Perhaps um, more relevant to, to our clinical practice here is the distinct distinction between grade A and B esophagitis and grade C and D esophagitis. And so grade A and B esophagitis has excellent healing with PPIs and uh, venoprazan, 
grade C and D, they're, they're significantly better healing with venoprazine versus uh, lansoprazole. Uh, this is lansoprazole once daily, um, which is perhaps a limitation of this study, but um, it does mean that it's potentially an option um, in patients who have, um, who have refractory esophagitis. Um, it's not available to us yet, but I think it's gonna be available very soon. The study should uh, publish uh, certainly next year. Um, there's another study that looked at um, refractory esophagitis. So patients who have ongoing esophagitis despite having PPIs uh, and 87% of those patients were healed with venoprazen. So it looks like it does have a role in, in PPI refractory healing. And in those patients, the symptoms improved as well. So patients that had refractory esophagitis, uh, there, was, there was also improved symptoms. So it, it may have a, a niche role, but it may, be, uh, it, it may be another thing in our armory. Um, these two um, graphs show at the top, uh, this is the symptom relief within the first week during the day, heartburn relief during the first day, during the first week. The solid line is venoprazan, the broken line is lansoprazole. And we can see, as I mentioned before, the, the, the symptom relief increases quicker so this is in the first seven days with venoprazan. So that's something we've seen before, but actually the, the, the line at the, the graph at the bottom is nocturnal symptom relief. And here we can see the nocturnal symptom relief stayed completely flat in, uh, in lansoprazole at around 10% for the first seven days. Whereas the nocturnal response uh, improved quite, quite quickly and dramatically in patients on venoprazan. So again, in patients who have nocturnal breakthrough symptoms, something like these, these PCAVs may have a role in our clinical practice. So they're not available yet, um, but uh, I think will be on the horizon very soon. Um, a word of caution, uh, and this is a study published last year, uh, which looks at symptom response with esomeprazole versus venoprazan in patients who are recruited based on symptoms alone. Um, so what this shows is, is that there's actually no difference in symptom response, so heartburn response, and, um, regurgitation response, when you have a patient who has reflux symptoms and you give them either esomeprazole or venoprazan. Um, these patients don't necessarily have esophagitis and in fact these patients don't necessarily have reflux and I think it's worth putting a word of caution about, uh, so I'm a bit of a digression, but a, a word of caution about recruiting patients on symptoms alone. And this is true to clinical studies of course, but it's also true to our selection of patients for how we treat them. It's true for selection of patients for surgery for strata. Um, so patients who have symptoms in a normal endoscopy, which is what the patients uh, that we, that we uh, that may well have included in that previous study, uh, you do reflux studies, as, as we're gonna, I'm sure we're going to hear about later. But there's a significant group of these patients who have completely normal esophageal acid exposure and are likely to have possibly acid hypersensitive esophagus, but more likely to have functional heartburn. And we know in patients who have functional heartburn, uh, if you give them omeprazole, for example, it's no better than placebo, but if you give them fluoxetine, the response rate is, is significantly greater uh, than omeprazole or placebo, a placebo. So treating these patients for hypersensitivity, treating with things like SSRIs rather than surgery, rather than PPIs, rather than venoprazan, um, is, uh, is important. And so I think in these studies where we're having negative responses, and I think this has actually been a downfall of many studies uh, done in reflux disease. And some of you may have been aware of a drug called Lisa Gabaran, which was um, a GABA antagonist, which was due, supposed to reduce uh, transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. That study failed. And again, because it almost certainly because it recruited patients just based on symptoms alone and included a significant number of heartburn, uh, functional heartburn patients. <clears throat> It's probably also given, bearing in mind the, the previous talk on strata, it's probably worth mentioning um, a study that was uh, published just a couple of months ago in ap and where there's a sham controlled study of strata uh, in patients with heartburn, which was a negative study, but again, was a study which recruited patients based on symptoms alone and didn't recruit patients based on physiology studies. Um, and so I think we have to be uh, extremely wary about how we're choosing patients not only for clinical studies, but how that reflects and how we choose our patients uh, in, uh, for treatments. And I think when it comes to reflux, there are a significant number of people who have functional heartburn. So we have to be careful about uh, checking for that and testing appropriately. Side effects with PCABs, um, there's good safety profiles so far in the studies. There's a bit of concern about high gastrin. Um, as we know, PPIs uh, increase uh, gastrin levels and there's always a theoretical concern about what that might mean in terms of um, 
uh, tube, potential tumor um, uh, promotion, the gastrin levels with uh, PCAVs are significantly higher than seen with PPIs. In PPIs, that hasn't really um, translated into a uh, clinical problem, but we don't know with PCAVs. The same problems we'd expect um, with PPIs in terms of traveler's diarrhea, clostridium difficile, dysbiosis. I think we'd expect all of those things with monoprazam. They're suppressing gastric acid and in fact doing it better. Uh, but I think they're promising. There's another um, drug which has been studied and published on this year, uh, which uh, is a, a drug in development at the moment, IW3718, which is a, a modified formulation of uh, colocevalan, which is a bile acid sequestrant. Uh, as as uh, many of you know, one of the potential causes of ongoing symptoms in patients with reflux uh, who are not responding to PPIs is the, co the content of bile acids within the refluxate. So reflux from the duodenum into the stomach that then refluxes back into the esophagus. Right? So called duodenogastroesophageal reflux. And so the idea about this drug is to bind the bile acids, sequester the bile acids in the stomach, so not further down the, bowel, down the gut, um, uh, to reduce um, bile reflux in the esophagus. And so there's a, a study published in gastroenterology this year, 280 patients with incomplete response to PPIs. Importantly, these patients are well-defined, so they have esophagitis and or a positive pH study. Uh, and weekly heartburn severity scores were measured. Now, on this measure, um, this is something called the weekly heartburn severity score, which, as far as I can make out, is something that was maybe made up for this study, but it's a, an average of um, daily maximums from the uh, rescue um, reflux score. Uh, so taking into account heartburn, burning feeling behind the breastbone and the centre of the stomach or pain in the centre of the stomach or upper stomach. Um, so a bit of a composite um, finding. But when you take that, there was a, uh, a dose-dependent response, but a, only a significant difference between placebo, which is the grey bar, and the high dose of this drug, which is the blue bar. Um, the change in symptoms from baseline is actually fairly modest. The absolute um, percentage uh, change is about 11%, 12%. You see a p-value of 0 0.04. Um, when you look into this study and look at the paper, if you look at the individual rescue con uh, questionnaire components, there isn't a significant change in regurgitation. There isn't a significant change in heartburn. There's no significant change in the epigastric bone in severity, and there's no change in LPR symptoms. So it looks like the positive outcome was only found with this composite measure. Uh, they did uh, say that further studies are required. There were some preclinical studies that were, you know, some, some translational studies that were due to be done with this, um, partly by our center, that they've pulled. And I, I'm slightly worried. I, I have a bit of a concern that this might be because they've done further studies that have possibly not shown a good outcome from this. You know, we were due to be hearing a bit more uh, and it hasn't come. So I can't say for certain, but there's perhaps a bit of a, a, bit of a, a concern that this, this drug might be failing. Uh, but we'll keep, a, we'll keep an open mind and, and wait and see. And then the final uh, medical intervention I'd like to talk about is mucosal protection. So again, this idea that the reflux contains lots of different aspects, not just acid. So if you can coat the uh, esophagus with a mucosal protectant, uh, something that stops reflux damaging the, esophagus, the, uh, the mucosa, then potentially you could have an impact on all of these things. Now, blatant uh, promotion of some studies that I've done, but um, this is looking at uh, alginates um, and a study which was done uh, ex vivo uh, where we labeled alginates and tried to wash them off. And you can get some uh, alginates to stick to the esophageal mucosa for a reasonable amount of time. We do in vivo studies, uh, which we just published this year, looking at uh, using impedance. Oh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Using impedance to assess um, uh, how well the, the alginates adhere to the mucosa. You can get um, some reasonable adherence uh, after, after taking the alginates, although it's maybe only about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but what does that mean in real life? Well, we know the best known alginate is, uh, is Gaviscon. So if you take um, patients who have proton pump uh, inhibitor refractory symptoms and add PPI or placebo, uh, sorry, add uh, placebo or Gaviscon advance. Um, so this paper published in 2017, they did an exploratory study of a few patients, which they were really excited about the results because they got the results back. And there was a huge difference between Gaviscon and PPIs. 
And so they went on all out for a very expensive study with several hundred patients and found absolutely no difference. Um, so when you add alginates to um, PPIs in patients with refractory reflux disease, they were found no difference between uh, between PPIs and alginates, uh, between placebo and alginates. And in fact, the placebo response is around 50%. Um, so even though we've shown all these nice studies to show that alginates stick to the esophageal mucosa, what it means in real life is, is not very much, it seems. There's a, another formulation which some of you may have heard of, um, which is a hyaluronic acid-based uh, drug. I say a drug, it's actually marketed as a medical device. So it, doesn't, uh, it isn't marketed as a drug. Uh, but it's something called uh, ESOX in, in Italy, um, Zivarel in the UK it can be bought um, on the internet. And it's taken after meals uh, uh, in the same way as you take Gaviscon. And there's, uh, it potentially has, has a mechanical barrier effect. There's a theoretical um, benefit in having immunomodulatory properties and potentially binds pepsin. Uh, there's one study uh, or one good study that's published, um, which was 154 patients. Uh, they were looking at a three-point reduction in, in, in reflux scores, uh, symptom scores, and they found a 52% response in the uh, active arm versus 30% in the placebo arm. So, And this is in patients who had ongoing symptoms with PPI. So there is a bit of data that adding Zivarel to, um, to PPIs can give benefit. And it's something that we can point our patients towards. Um, some availability has been a little bit uh, up and down, but it's something that can be bought over the internet and might be worth thinking about. Um, and then the final slides, the future, um, just to, was, since we're talking about nerves and, and whether we're frying the nerves with strata, uh, we looked I, at in, in, in non-erosive reflux disease, the nerves are sitting, the, the, the uh, nociceptive nerves that are set, probably sensing reflux are sitting right near the surface, sort of right up next to the luminal surface. And, uh, and in fact, these uh, nerves express acid sensitive receptors such as TRIP-V1. So um, going forward, I wonder if there's an opportunity to drug our topical treatments. Um, and so if we could put antagonists to these medications, so trip one antagonists, for example, onto topical treatments, it may be another opportunity to, to reduce reflux in, in refractory patients. And so that's something that we're looking at at the moment. Um, Gaps. So I think our medical gaps are something, you know, we do definitely have patients who have unsatisfactory response to PPIs. Regurgitation is particularly troublesome and is very difficult to manage outside of surgery. Um, and we do need to find better treatments for non-acid components to reflux. Uh, I don't think there are any good treatments for LPR, and this is a big gap, and I think we're going to hear a bit more about that later. Uh, and functional heartburn is troublesome, and, and there's two things about that. One, we should recognize it, and two, we need to think about ways that we can treat it better, because this is a, a difficult group of patients. Um, so in terms of new drugs, PCABs, um, something that is on the horizon and may have a role, particularly in esophagitis healing and refractory disease, bile acid sequestrants may happen and mucosal protectants, I hope in the 15 years time, we'll be able to be talking about as useful, um, useful adjuncts to uh, reflux treatment. Thank you very much. Well, that's <clears throat> fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that 30% gap is still a 30% gap, isn't it? 20, 30 years later, it's fascinating. Um, so several questions, um, and one that's quite dear to our heart, as I think um, Anthony will be talking a little bit later on, is uh, this issue of what you say to patients um, uh, with regard to the use of long-term PPIs, what advice you give them, um, and what you think the, actually, could I just interrupt? I think somebody in the background may not be muted. Um, so can I just check if you're not talking, if you, if I could just ask everybody to mute, because otherwise we get a lot of sort of background noise. Um, so anyway, to go, to go back to the PPI issue, long-term usage, and, and in particular, Phil, what about, um, what about PPIs, the effect on the gastrointestinal biome, its association with Cebu, and all those symptoms which may of course mimic reflux itself yeah i think i think there's two things with ppi use isn't there the, the, the first is the immediate symptoms that some people get and, and we certainly do know that patients can get um uh, particularly gastrointestinal side effects from from ppis um and there are a, a number of people who struggle with that and, and you solve one thing create another problem 
Uh, I'm sure, Anthony, you will have something to say on that. Um, in some ways, that's, that's slightly easier uh, because if they're getting symptoms as a result of taking PPIs, um, then we need to find an alternative. Um, and, and so long as we're happy that they, they have reflux, so this is one of the very good indications for anti-reflux surgery, is patients who, whose reflux symptoms get better with PPIs, but other things come about. Um, and I think that's actually quite an easy situation to have a discussion about. And I mean, the discussion is really about what, what, you know, what, is, um, what is more concerning to your life and your quality of life. Is it your reflux symptoms? Is it the symptoms of, um, of having the PPIs? Or is it the consideration of having surgery? And I think uh, that's, that's a discussion with the patients. In terms of long-term effects, um, this, I, 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 I think I, would ne I never would recommend somebody not to take PPIs because I'm concerned about their long-term health with it. I don't think we're in a situation where we can say that, uh, at least as a, as, a, as a direct bit of advice. But what, what I always do would say, it's a drug. Any drug has potential harms. We've been using them for a long time. As I mentioned, we have so many millions of, of, of patient years of, um, of experience with PPIs, and I, and I don't think we are finding dramatic problems, but there's always a chance. And I think, it's, again, it's a weighing up of, of, of patient values as much as anything else. Um, how much do their symptoms bother them versus how much is the, the concern of a small risk, but potentially a present risk of long-term harm? Um, and you know, how, how, do they, how do they want to address that? Um, you know, we can never say what's going to happen in 20 years and what patients are going to be, what, what's going to be coming out on the other side in terms of side effects. But, you know, and, I think and, patient, patients are certainly driving this much more than doctors, I think. Yeah. And, and, and I suppose that just um, there's, a, there's a couple of other questions uh, around the, the effect on potentially gut biome, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And Peter asked, he said there's suggestions that PPIs may predispose to respiratory tract infections. Um, could this also yeah. be changes in the respiratory biome? Yeah, again, these are all um, these are all things which there there is a bit of data about. Um, I wouldn't say any of the data is is hugely convincing, but it's data, and you know, maybe there's no smoke without fire. Maybe there is. Um, I, I think it's all part of the conversation. We can never say to patients that there is zero chance of harm from medications. We can say with PPIs that the, the harm is, is pretty low or the, risk, the, the evidence of harm is pretty low, but we can't say it's zero. And so everything's a balance. And this is what we do in medicine and surgery, isn't it? We discuss the pros and cons of all of the, all of the above and, and see, come to an agreement with the patients. Okay, um, uh, Bobby, uh, any, um, he says, does Phil have any updated thoughts on rebound acid hypersecretion? Presumably that's on stopping PPIs. Yes, um, I do, uh, based on a couple of things. One is, um, I, I don't know how much, of it, well, I can tell you, there's one, there's a study which is a really, really, really nice study from many, many years ago where uh, completely healthy, I think medical students were given high dose cetomeprazole for about eight weeks and then stopped suddenly. And, and pretty much everybody developed some GI symptoms. A lot of patients developed heartburn, a lot of patients developed um, dyspepsia. So you can induce uh, reflux symptoms by stopping PPIs quickly. Whether it's because of rebound or not is a different matter. In fact, we, we did a study, we published a study this year where we looked at um, the effect of stopping PPIs and symptoms and correlating that to reflux data. And in fact, you don't necessarily, the, the, the onset of heartburn stopping PPIs is not actually necessarily associated with development of acid reflux. Some patients develop it without any acid reflux whatsoever. So it may be a, a, an inflammatory thing or a sensitivity thing that happens. So it may not be rebound acid secretion, but certainly there's a rebound symptoms on stopping PPIs. Um, so I think this is one of the reasons why patients end up on a lot of PPIs long-term is that they're often given, stopped, and then the symptoms come back and then they're on it for the rest of their life. So what, what I do say is that if patients stop it and symptoms come back is it's worth another go, but with a really gradual reduction. Uh, maybe even stopping one tablet a week um, and, and tapering it off over over seven six seven eight weeks and that that in my experience has been a, a sometimes gets gets more patients off it 